All right, so I'm here with Bobby Southworth, and uh, I had had him on my show previously. We had discussed some fights of Ryan Bow, but I wanted to bring him back to kind of just do something to focus on him primarily. And uh, for people that may not know who you are, I kind of like to let guys introduce themselves as they were maybe in the beginning era, or maybe some of the newer fans don't know who either one of us are, you know? <laughs> so, gotcha. Um, how's it going, everybody? I'm Bobby Southworth. Um, Former tough one contestant, um, pride veteran, UFC veteran, um, Strike Force light inaugural Strike Force light heavyweight champion, only man to ever defend the Strike Force light heavyweight title. Um, just here for your listening pleasure and to talk to Tom. Now, when did you kind of find the sport the first time? Do you remember like what year it was? It was 1994, and I had a an old high school friend who I had seen for a little while. He was a, his name was Conti Leon. He was a, he was a Chinese immigrant, you know, and his father owned a restaurant, his family owned a restaurant and he worked in the restaurant, but he knew a little bit of Kung Fu. And I was always interested in martial arts, but I could never train when I was a kid and my parents wouldn't really allow it, but he would always like show me these, like how to be the sidekick not really formal training, but he would just give me little tips. And uh, we reconnected just on a whim, man. I'm from a, I'm from a coastal town. I was driving the coast. And he had recently bought this house and he was renovating the house. And I was like, drove by, I saw him. Hadn't seen him for a couple of years, hopped out. I said, what's up? He said, we, you know, chop it up for me. He said, oh, dude, have you seen the ultimate fighting championship? And I was like, what is that? And so he took me, we went inside and he, Popped in a V, opened it, popped the tape in the VCR. That's how long it was. And he fired it up, and he, he we sat there and watched the first two UFCs. So in every fight, he was like, "Oh man, how he's gonna win?" And you know, you pick the kung fu guy, the karate guy, and hoist, you know, the stuff you always saw in the movies, and everybody thought was badass. You know, all the all the false marketing everybody fell for back in the day, and um, the hoist just kept tapping everybody out, and ended up winning the first two and he's like heard of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and this is in 1994 so I'd heard of it <clears throat> and um, he actually had been going down and training with the Gracies and taking some private lessons down there and he had told me that he was a businessman this guy was a hustler he was always business minded and he could see that you know there's going to be money in Jiu Jitsu and so he was bringing this guy up and he was only a purple belt but at the time, that was a big deal. And a lot of people in the jiu-jitsu community will remember this guy. He, my jiu-jitsu instructor, his name was Marco Albuquerque. Um, his nickname, everybody called him Jadaraka. And a lot of old school Brazilian people will remember this guy. He ended up getting murdered in a favela somehow. He got, they got carjacked and the car got took in a favela. And unfortunately, he was shot trying to escape. Anyways, he was bringing that guy and invited me to come try class. And at the time, this was in my home, I was actually living and working in Oakland. And so I came down and tried and just instantly fell in love with it. The first class they showed this like headlock escape. And when I was like 12 or 13, some wrestler kid had held me in a headlock and socked me up on the ground a little bit. And so learning how to get out of that position was like really eye-opening when I just fell in love with jujitsu right away. So I was actually driving they had morning classes and I was working a shift that went from 11.30 in the morning till 7.30 in the morning. And so I would, every morning I would try to get off early, like at 5.30, anytime before my full shift, because the first morning class was like at like eight o'clock or 8.30 to 10. And then the second class was 10.30 to noon, something like that. I was driving down you know, every single day to take this classes for a triangle on Conti and you know how if you've ever trained or anybody who's ever trained you know how when you're the senior student and the younger guy kind of generates a submission hold on or gets close to tapping you they generally ramp it up well he ended up hurting and he ran over he did something I ended up hurting my rib and I was out for a while but during that time Caesar Gracie came down and gave his seminar and I found out that Caesar Gracie's gym was maybe 20, 25 minutes away from where I it was in Walnut Creek or Pleasant Hill, 25 minutes away from where I was living in Oakland. And I had been driving an hour and a half to take these classes. 
So I healed up, I drove over to Caesars. He made me run this gauntlet with a bunch of his more experienced students and I did pretty well. And that's kind of where I really started in jujitsu first with Marco, then with Caesar. And shortly after that, Half Gracie came up from Brazil and kind of took over my training. And then I ended up moving back to my hometown of Santa Cruz and commuting and working for Half Gracie as the, the first instructor at the Half Gracie Academy in Mountain View, California, which is still there to this day. I want to talk about what the scene was like in California at that time when you're having these new guys come up from Brazil and maybe how it, was, it differs from today. Oh, it was, it really differed a lot. You know, there was a, you know, when I actually I moved to Texas in 2010 and kind of, it was like a time warp of jumping back. So back in the day, you know, I would say it was very tribal. Um, and you can go on YouTube and see guys like Matt Thornton and Chris Howder, some legends in West Coast Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and martial arts talking about those times in the 90s where there was really a lot of, they would like dole it out. You know what I mean? It's like, there were, you know, I mean, I don't know how it is in Brazil, but, you know, in America, guys were soaking jiu-jitsu up and, and getting good very quickly. And there was a lot of, within the family, there was a lot of drama. And among the Brazilian jiu-jitsu community as a whole, meaning the Gracies and the non-Gracie Brazilians, there was a lot of drama. And so guys would be get, getting a hard time for teaching their students too much or showing the quote-unquote good techniques. And then there was a lot of tribalism going on where, like I had a friend, he lived, I knew him since high school. He lived in Santa Cruz. He was training at a different gym. And I was coming back down in the beginning to spend the weekends with my daughter. And so we would get together on the weekends and train together. And when that was found out, it was, a, it was, a, it was, it was an issue. I'll just say that. Um, and all, I mean, you know, I, I didn't see the issue, man. I was just trying to get better so I could represent my academy at the tournaments. And, you know, I, within the first couple of classes, I knew that I wanted to be, to do jujitsu. I wanted to live the jujitsu life, teach jujitsu, pass on knowledge, be an instructor. And so that's all I was trying to do was increase my knowledge and increase, get more experience so I could be a better instructor. But they kind of you cannot train here. Your friend trains at another gym, you fly our flag. So you train with us and nobody else, or you can't train here anymore. And you'll hear that story up and down the West Coast from anywhere probably from 1992 to 2000 something. But then all that changed, you know, I don't know what happened, but Jiu Jitsu was, it was a premium prices. And I think a lot of people, it was like, when I started at Caesars, and I'll put it to you this way, when I started training at Caesars to take one class a week, Four classes a month was $179 a month. To train unlimited at Caesars was like $300 a month. So to train five days a week or take unlimited classes, that's a lot of money. Um, and I think a lot of people kind of rebelled. I was like, look, man, we're paying you to provide a service outside of the gym. You don't tell us how to live our lives. You know, uh, it's kind of like if you were going to McDonald's and the general manager was coming out telling you, you can't eat a Burger King. You can't eat a Taco Bell because you eat here, you don't eat anywhere else. Everybody, you know, they'd be flipping you the bird and you, McDonald's will lose a whole bunch of business. So that all changed, you know, in, in, in California now, there's a real open door, you know, and that's that's what I remember before moving to Texas is, I mean, just if you take our gym with AKA, you have Josh Thompson and Gilbert Melendez, you know, they, they fought pretty epic battles for the Strike Force title. But when they weren't fighting each other, they were training together. You know, Gilbert and Jake were coming down and training. And that meant that Jake, who was a 170 pounder and a 185 pounder, was training with John Fitch, Josh Koscheck, Mike Swick, all the other guys that were in those weight ranges, you know, and everybody wanted to get better. It was the same thing. We wanted to gain experience. We wanted to increase our skills. And that's one of the reasons I think that, you know, AKA as a gym excelled is because we had an open door policy and that attracted a lot of fighters to come train, knowing that they could get a lot of different looks and add a lot of tools to their, you know, to their skill set. And it's another reason I think that AKA as a whole has had a lot of fighters, you know, I'm not going to say I was the most successful fighter, but I was far from the least successful fighter. And... <clears throat> We've had dozens of champions and lots of organizations at lots of different weight classes. And I think along with the coaching that that had something to do with it. Now, 
you were at half when like BJ and Dave Camarillo and those guys were there. I was there before. I was there before, before them. them. I was actually the first guy to to formally teach BJ Pan Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Um, he came over from Hawaii. He was like 16 year old kid, and he was actually brought. It's really funny when I talk about this because I didn't know this. There's another Jiu Jitsu phenom named Keenan Cornelius. If some people will probably know who he is, but I found this out like a year ago. This guy was talking. So yeah, Keenan's dad, Tom Callis. And I was like, what? Because when BJ came over, it was Tom Callis who actually came from Hawaii with him. First trip that BJ made over to train at half race season. So when they came to the gym and BJ was doing his first couple of classes, Tom Callis was sitting right there. And it was just funny when I heard that because that's just kind of a strange connection. You have these two jujitsu phenoms years apart and they're connected by the same guy. Um, and I just always thought that was interesting. But yeah, BJ, our Hoff Gracie's gym was definitely one of the top gyms for academies in Northern California at the time. You know, there was there was a Claudio Francis, there was Hoff Gracie's, and then there was a school in in um, Sacramento with a, with a, a black belt named Tatio Vernick. And those were the, the, the gyms that I remember having the guys that stood out the most at the tournaments. There were other schools that were really good, but in my opinion, those were the three best because those were the guys I saw standing on the podium the most. And it was on, you know, nobody just walked into our gym and like, like hung with people, you know what I mean? And DJ came in and he had the guillotine, a few of the more experienced white belts, and choke, choke, rear naked choke, a couple of the more experienced white belts. And he gave those of us the blue belts, which at the time was, was you know, having a blue belt from half race was kind of a big deal in 1996. Um, he gave us, you know, a run for our money, you know, and I could see from the beginning that, and I told Half, I want to do this kid. This kid's going to, he's good. He's talented. He's really only been learning from like watching the fights and a couple of the tapes that were out at the time. There were like three tape series. There was the Bill Moriera tape series. There was the, um, how Hoist Gracie, I'm the best because I know the basics. And then there was other kid who came from Brazil, he hopped on the plane as a purple belt and got off the plane as a black belt. His name was Kazeka Muniz and he had a tape series out. So at the time, those were really the, the first three Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu tape series. I think they all were from Panther Video Productions. If you're a long time enough fan or anybody that is, they'll remember back in the day, the Panther videos. And then they had the Marco Hula's videos, the Oleg Octorov videos and all the other ones before videos became what they are today. So, um, but BJ was talented and you can see that from the beginning, you know, and I, we still talk about it to this day, the times that we had training at that gym. I mean, the, the people at the time it was called great systems and there was house and Caesar that was their Academy and they were together and it lasted that for about a year, but then some stuff happened. And again, you can see videos on this on YouTube, you know, Horian sued the whole family. So nobody could say Gracie Jiu-Jitsu Academy. It had to be Henzo Gracie Jiu-Jitsu, Alf Gracie Jiu-Jitsu, Caesar Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. And there was this whole big internal war between, the, you know, I guess between the family over this copywriting or these trademarking things. And I, you know, that I think that has a lot to do. This this tribalism thing has has kind of shadowed Jiu-Jitsu. I think ever since the beginning. There's another video you can watch was news to me. I never heard about this. And I was a little bit on the inner circle with the Northern California family. There's a, a man who defeated Elio Gracie, uh, the Brazilian guy who was taught by the guys for the descendants of the Fada lineage, or I didn't even know about that until recently either. There's a whole video on it and all this stuff that went down. I'm not really trying to stir that up or talk about that drama, but those things are now, they're historical facts in the jiu-jitsu history and in the it's all in this digitized, newly digitized library in Brazil. And so a lot of people didn't know this history. And it's unfortunate that this thing is this tribalistic side of jujitsu. And, you know, you train here, you don't train anywhere else. Because I think, I mean, look what jujitsu has done worldwide, how it's exploded. It would have gone, it would have gone farther faster, in my opinion, if some of this stuff hadn't gone on in the beginning. But it's still a beautiful art. And the art itself has transcended all of the politics. And, I think that's great for all of us who practice jiu-jitsu. Now, as someone who's teaching BJ jiu-jitsu, what do you see as like a maybe some of his early strengths when you were working with him? 
oh my god i mean his bj's fight iq was phenomenal um at first you know at first i thought flexibility was his greatest asset but all of his brothers are flexible like him you know they can all do that thing where they can sit down and flip their feet up behind their head it's i don't know if it's a hawaiian thing you know living where it's nice and warm and humid and it keeps you limber i don't know but they were all flexible but all of them it's i mean everybody talks about that i mean every culture has the warrior side to them you, you know everybody says oh irish people are born fighters mexicans are born fighters hawaiians are born fighters but every ethnicity has warrior lineage in its background. And that's kind of puts everybody on the same playing field. You know what I mean? But these guys, their fight IQ and their physical gifts were just, you know, BJ's especially second to none. And it was funny because BJ was a little, he was a little guy. He was only 16. I mean, he's still not a big man, you know, he was a littler guy and he was only 16. And then I met his brothers and they were all like six feet. Well, two of them, JD and Reagan were like six feet. They're bigger guys. And so when I first trained with those guys, these guys are going to be better than BJ because they're bigger than me. But <clears throat> BJ was the fighter of the family. And obviously history speaks to that fact, you know, but I just thought in meeting them that if these guys had more, had had that same focus and that same drive that BJ had, they could potentially be better fighters than him but not everybody you know not everybody does jujitsu for that not every, i mean jujitsu has millions of practitioners worldwide and the majority of those practitioners probably 95 percent of them they're like what i like to call soul rollers you know they're not people who are looking to be the next ibjjf champion or the next uh, abcc champ or fight in the ufc they just love jujitsu for the physical mental and emotional you know, and the benefits that it offers to everybody. And really that is what the mass appeal of jujitsu is. You know, you don't have to go fight MMA. You can roll with your buddy on the mat and still get that, that fighting and getting out of the choke before you tap, primal buzz, fight for survival type thing. That is really what I think attracts a lot of people to jujitsu. Now you were talking about AKA earlier. You got there kind of when it was first maybe becoming what it was maybe talk about no. the people well i mean I in the early before, stages right i was there before there was any fight team at aka and it was right. myself and javier and bj who actually founded the aka fight team um that's really where it started was me and bj trying to get a bunch of guys together guys who wanted to do mma and javier you know got behind us and gave us the noon training time which for a long before covid Everybody was still training at noon, I think. But yeah, there, there was, in the beginning, when I first came to AKA, I was actually walking in the door when Frank Shamrock was walking out and he had just won. I think we talked about this in the last interview. He had just won the King of Pancrates title. But there really wasn't a team at AKA. There was, Brian Johnson had a couple guys that he was training submissions. So there was kind of a submission fighting team, but it wasn't really anything organized. Um, and I was lucky enough that when Javier brought me in, I had met and rolled with all the guys that Brian Johnson like took a liking to me and spoke highly of me to Javier. And Javier brought me in and said, I, I would like to have a jujitsu program. I know that you were teaching at Health Gracie's. Would you like to run a jujitsu program here? And I was like, sure. He said, if you'll teach jujitsu here, I'll teach you striking because I know you want to fight and striking is going to be a big part of that. And that's kind of what got the ball rolling. And then after, I don't know, a year or two, and BJ had won the world championship, and he was thinking about transitioning into MMA. And he had, he had come to actually one or two of my MMA fights. It's like, your striking has really improved. And I was like, well, dude, you need to come over here because Javier is here, and he's the guy that's pretty much brought me up. And BJ pretty much came to AKA because I was there and at my urging. And then, and again, it was a similar situation. Javier took a liking to him. Um, BJ performed well when he came in and like BJ came in and was, he was hanging with some experienced strikers and kickboxers and Javier saw that pretty much the same thing I saw when BJ came for his first jiu-jitsu class, like the potential that he had. You know what I mean? It was like BJ and BJ was going to be great no matter what. He, 
there are a lot of fighters like that. Cain Velasquez. I mean, all there are guys that come to certain academies and you know that they're going to be great. You know, you know that they're going to do, be something special in the sport. And BJ was one of the first guys, in my opinion, <clears throat> that I really saw. I mean, I came late to MMA. You know what I mean? I, didn't, I was 25 before I even started training before I even knew what jujitsu was. So whatever I did in the sport, you know, I, I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunities that I have because I came in late, you know, at 25 years old, just starting jujitsu. And you look at 25 years old, Max Holloway was world champion with 20 something UFC fights already, you know? So sometimes you, there are talents that come to academies, not just AKA, where the coaches can see that these guys will be something special. You know, and I was just lucky to be around that. Now, had BJ stayed at AK for his whole career, do you think it would have been different or played out different? Um, I don't know. You know, part of what makes BJ the fighter that he is is is, is a very headstrong individual, you know, and BJ is going to do what he wants to do regardless of what you tell him. So, you know, if if – all you know honestly bj's bj's greatest opponent has been bj Penn. um i remember a coach is saying this about me and sometimes as individuals whether and it, it can be in different aspects of your life or in fighting sometimes you are the obstacle that is in your way of ultimate success right and honestly i think that you know i think that and that's what i mean by that statement is that bj was his own worst enemy it's like Nobody be really beat BJ, but BJ, um, regardless of what was happening in the ring. You know what I mean? It's like what you saw in the results of those fights where BJ has lost are mostly the results of, you know, BJ just being BJ. And to, to honestly, I mean, if you look at Cain Velasquez, I mean, this guy, this, I've never seen anybody as focused as Cain. This guy was just a maniac. I mean, literally, Javier would tell Kane, go over there and throw a thousand right leg kicks on that bag. And you go after practice, you know, two hour, two and a half hour practice. Kane, Kane needs to get better at his kicks. Javier telling him, go over on that bag, throw a thousand kicks. Don't stop till you're done. Everybody leaves and goes to lunch, we come back to get our stuff. An hour and a half later, Kane's right there throwing kicks. 150. You know what I mean? Just that kind of a focus. And that's rare. You know, and BJ and Kane and that focus, that was just how Kane lived his life. In my opinion, there are times where BJ definitely had that level of focus, but I don't think it was sustainable. And I think those are some of the things that were affecting the results of his fights. I, I honestly can't, I honestly don't think that there's a naturally more talented fighter. You know, the, for all the fighters that you've seen, I, I just, I doubt that there's anybody with, they've developed the skills and they develop experience, but the stuff that I saw BJ do with the minimal amount of most, cause I saw him at the beginning of jujitsu. I saw him at the beginning of striking. I saw him at the beginning of wrestling and the things he could do, you know, with, with the, the littlest amount of knowledge and experience were phenomenal, you know, and, and that's a rare thing. You know? So I wouldn't say it would be different if he had stayed at AKA the whole time, I don't know. You know, that's a question for the ages. I can't, I can't answer it. Now, when it comes to AK, was it Javier, Bob, and Frank, or was it some other sort of, I guess, like a leadership? Um, Frank had his own thing going on. And in the beginning, it was more Frank and Crazy Bob. And then Frank kind of went off to do this. He tried, if you remember when he did Walker, Texas Ranger, and he was trying to be a movie star, trying to do the Hollywood thing. And there was a period of time where he was gone. And during that time, some of his guys, which was me, BJ, and Javier. Um, Crazy Bob was one of those guys. He actually, I mean, there were a lot of firsts, man. If you go back to the beginning of CrossFit, the friend that I had mentioned to you, who I used to train with jujitsu in Santa Cruz on the weekend at Claudio Franza Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, that's where CrossFit got started. Before anybody knew what CrossFit was, before they were doing their internet rowing contests and all of those things, 
in maybe 1998, 1999, Cross Greg Glassman was pulling his Aerodynes and his Concept II rowers out and putting them on the mats of Claudio Francis either before the jiu-jitsu classes or after the jiu-jitsu classes and putting them away so the jiu-jitsu classes could get started. Um, and their first home screen actually was myself, BJ, one or two of his brothers, Crazy Bob, and another jiu-jitsu legend named Paul Triner and my friend Garth Taylor, all spaced real close together doing one, one of the <clears throat> Striking a pose for one of the movements in what used to be called the BJ, it's called the BJ Penn workout now, but it used to be called the Fight Gone Bad workout. And so that was actually CrossFit's first home screen when they started to go do everything on the internet. So there were a lot of things converging. You know, I, I feel really blessed and a lot of the guys were really blessed to have these things that just, I mean, who would have thought back then that CrossFit was going to be what it is today? Right? Who would have thought that MMA was going to be what it is today? Who would have thought that Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu would have grown to what it is today? And who would have thought that AKA would have become the phenomenon in the, in the internationally recognized brand that it is today? But all those things kind of converged and helped a lot of fighters and a lot of other you know, aspects of the MMA and fitness industry emerge. Um, so it was more, honestly, in the beginning, it was more me and BJ and Javier and then as Bob segued in, it became more Javier and Bob because that was when BJ, you know, he BJ segued off and started doing his own his own training camps and training other places and doing other things and kind of left AKA. Um, and Frank wasn't there. And so Bob had a handful of fighters and we had a handful of guys and that kind of merged into one unit. And Bob had already been getting fights for me and some of the other guys. And so that's how it kind of emerged as Javier being the head coach and Bob kind of being more of the manager, getting most of his fights. So it, it, there were different things at different times. And then it kind of became Javier and Bob. And, you know, unfortunately, I just found out a few months ago, I don't even think Bob is involved with the AKA fight team anymore. Um, Ron Kessler is now the head coach, not trying to open up a can and I'm not even, don't even want to get involved in, whatever that is, but that's just what I found out kind of on a random visit to the gym. A lot of history there, man. You know, I've known those, both of those guys for a long time. I'm not sure what happened and it's unfortunate, but both of them are still, still doing well. And obviously AKA is still a prominent force in the MMA world. And I'm happy both guys and for the team either way and hopefully in the future things can be reconciled and you know I've been gone I've been living in Texas I've been back sporadically I've been living in San Antonio since 2010 um just unfortunate you know when you hear about things like that and you know there there was a relationship that had lasted for 20 years more than 20 years that I know of to, to fizzle out for whatever reasons it did it's just unfortunate it made me sad it made me sad but that's how life, you know, life goes on. Because I know Bob had a big fight reputation also. He had a handful of fights. I don't remember how many, but he kind of maybe was one of those guys we were expecting to do more, and then he didn't for whatever reason. It would have been hard. You know, Bob definitely was an, uh, a very skilled martial artist, and he's definitely one of the toughest guys ever to get on the maps in MMA training at AKA. But one of the reasons they called he got the nickname Crazy Bob is because he was working like as a lot. Of, he did a lot of things, but carpentry and and lumberjacking were one of his, the things that he did. And at one point, he was using a nail gun and he shot a nail gun and it rebounded and it pierced his eye. And so he didn't go blind. But what they had to do was they had to put in a fake cornea or whatever the part of your eye is or an iris, the part that opens and closes with the light. So they put if it's if that's Whatever that is, they had to put a fake one of those in. And so one of Bob's eyes, it doesn't dilate close with light. It just has a constant thing. And so what happened was we talked about M who would have thought MMA would grow to the point that it is. Well, MMA grew because of the regulations, right? They brought the weight classes. They brought the gloves. They brought in the doctors and all of the medical stuff. And so Bob, yes, would have been a great fighter, but unfortunately, that when 
he had one UFC fight and he beat Tiki Golden um, at 170 pounds. I, and I, I believe that Tiki didn't even make the weight in that fight. And, I mean, if you know Tiki, Tiki was a great fighter and he's now a great coach. He's got a lot of good fighters fighting in the UFCs and some top organizations. Um, Bob ended up beating him in a, in a banger. Um, and then regulation came in and that's pretty much what, what killed Bob's fight careers because he would not have been able to pass the only part of the physical of the medical examinations he wouldn't have been able to pass would have been the eye exam. But unfortunately, that was enough to, to kill his fighting career, unfortunately. But Bob was a great training partner, great martial artist. Pound for pound, again, one of the one of the toughest guys to come to, to ever train at the AKA in the old days. We used to have some yeah, him and a lot of guys will tell you, and even to this day, Bob, they'll always say Bob still give you one good round, so watch out. So if he comes in for one round, you better be ready to better put Better, better bring your A game. And like, what do you remember, Frank, as far as it? I mean, like for oh, some Frank. of us, I look back on him as I think he should be in the UFC Hall of Fame, for example. You know, definitely. Uh, yeah. What did you think of him from what you saw and, you know, his career? I mean, being around him like that. <clears throat> you know, Frank was a great fighter. You know, again, the, the, the thing on um, the fight IQ, the athletic ability, you know, and, and he really was a visionary because he was one of the first guys who saw, I mean, I ended up going to AKA because, you know, Vico Belfort came on the scene Maurice, and Maurice Smith beat Conan Silvera. And so for people who were fans or who were training martial arts, if you, if you didn't see how there was a little bit of a shift in the game that, right, because for a long time, it was the jujitsu guys and the wrestlers who were dominating, right, because the strikers didn't have any grappling. And for a while, jiu-jitsu was getting the better of the wrestlers, but then the wrestlers started training jiu-jitsu. And that's still true to this day. There's no pure wrestlers that are successful in MMA without having jiu-jitsu behind them. You know, they're all purple belt level, high level purple belts, and, and they're successful in MMA. But then the strikers started learning wrestling. And at that time, jiu-jitsu, we used to have this saying that jiu-jitsu is stuck between bad judo and bad wrestling. But then, so the strikers were learning wrestling and then the and jujitsu guys couldn't get them to the ground. And then they didn't have the stand-up skills. You know, they're, they were stuck between bad judo and bad wrestling and their striking is worse, most of them, except for me, too, right? But then what happened was the jujitsu schools started bringing wrestlers in. And I believe at first it was ETT, Nova Union. ETT brought down an Olympic, Olympian named Daryl Golar and he started training a lot of the BTT guys. And that was when you saw Murillo throwing Matt Linland all over the cage and out wrestling Matt Linland. And um, I'm not sure, I think it was John Janicek that went down to Nova Union and there may have been some other guys. It's been a lot. I mean, I've been in this for almost 27 years now. And so there's been a lot of fights, a lot of people. So sometimes some of those things get foggy, but that's what was happening. And what I was getting at was, people were seeing the game was adapting. So wrestlers were learning jujitsu and striking. Strikers were learning wrestlers wrestling and jujitsu and the smart jujitsu guys were learning wrestling and striking. And Frank, I think you had asked about Frank. I think that he saw in the beginning and he came in at the perfect time. He came in where he had already been cross training enough striking and cross training enough wrestling and cross training enough jujitsu or submission. And then he added the key element, which was conditioning. Because Frank was the first one to really talk about cardio, and he was the first guy to take jujitsu beyond the beyond the brawl, right? To get in, to like take a guy into deep waters, right? To know that you could outlast him in grappling, outlast him in strike, and that's what he did to Tito, right? He took Tito into deep waters, and Tito, and this was before Tito was the conditioned athlete that he became. Frank was the first guy, and that's what I mean by he was a visionary. And that's what I think of him. He had good striking, he had good wrestling, he had good jiu-jitsu, and he had great conditioning, and he was smart enough to blend all, he had the vision enough to blend all of that together. And I think that's what made him the champion that he is. And I definitely think he should be in the Hall of Fame, but he wouldn't be in the Zufa Hall of Fame. He yeah. wouldn't be in the, I don't think, because all of his titles were pre-Zufa. And I don't, I'm not sure what happened you know, Frank was a great fighter. We didn't always see eye to eye. I think we touched on that in the previous interview. Sometimes we get two alphas and, 
you know, Frank was always up there. And he, I was always looking at him as somebody that I wanted to be better than. And so there was always that in my mind. And so sometimes we were butting heads. And I think that that's what happened to Frank was because he had that mindset, that mindset even higher than me, like even more alpha where him and Dana were butting heads and Frank was kind of trying to maybe thought that he was more than he was in Dana's eyes. Dana didn't think, and I don't know what was said or what was done, but I think there was a butting of heads and that's what kept him out of, out of the zoo or the modern hall of fame. But anybody who was a fan of, who's been a fan of the sport can't deny Frank's contributions to the sport or the fighter that he was, you know, there, his, his, his record speaks for itself. Now you're part of the first ultimate fighter, right? How, so how did that come about? Um, I honestly don't know. There's, there was a, they did a show that talked about it where they touched on some stuff that became new to me, but the way I got involved was Javier and I had had a falling out at some point um, over business relationships business relationship and some financial compensation and unfortunately I got kicked out of um, AKA you know and I had founded the jiu-jitsu program there and I was one of the coaches of the fight team and that was how Dave Camarillo came into AKA and so I was gone for a year I just went I basically walked away from the sport went back to doing the job that I had had before I was a poker dealer um I was Watching still, I was all I've always been a fan of the sport. You know, I was watching UFCs before I ever started training. You know, I was just a guy like you who got up and did his first jujitsu class and loved it and kept doing jujitsu and then tried a tournament, you know, and did another tournament. And then the next level would be to go to MMA. And I was just always willing to step up for the next level. And that's what really got me into fighting. But I walked away from it for a year. And I saw some of the guys who had come to AKA while, you know, I was one of the mainstays there, Paul Butello, Josh Thompson, some of the other guys, they were doing, fighting in the UFC and they were having success. And I was like, man, I, I'm a better fighter than them. I think I can make another go at this. And so I talked to Bob and Bob smoothed things over with Javier for me to come back into the gym. And I remember it like it was yesterday. I came into the gym on a Monday and Trained, right? And I hadn't really done much training for a year. Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays were sparring days. And I tried to do everything, you know, and everybody was talking about the ultimate fighter and this tape and that Swick and Fitch and these guys were going to be on the show. And I was asking Bob, like, you know, what's up with this? I'm like, well, I, I want to do this. I want to try. And he's all, well, it's too late. He's all they already did. They've already made all of the stuff. And I said, well, if you won't send in the tape, give me the address and I'll send my own tape in. He's all right, all right, give me the tape and I'll send it in for you. So he sent it in. And I didn't know this at the time, but there was a show that was on um, Spike Television. Now it's Paramount, where they were talking about this time. And so they were casting this reality show. And the Spike executives, they were trying to cast characters, right? Guys sent in their audition tapes guys that gave good interviews, guys that gave good drama, but they had no fighting skills, right? And so that's who they were selecting for the show. And then Dana came in and said something like, wait a minute, dude, you, this isn't gonna be keeping up with the Kardashians and MMA because at the end of the, line, at the end of the day, these guys are gonna have to fight. And if these guys can't fight for shit, then what good is the show gonna be? And so then they started casting fighters and the, the process for casting the fighters, you had to go through a federal background check. Um, you had to come out and interview and interview well, and then you had to, to pass a, a, a talk screen, a drug screening. So obviously I had come in late, but they called me out there and I guess I interviewed well. And I already had a little bit of a relationship with Dana. We known each other. He had scouted me. I actually was supposed to have a fight in the UFC prior to that, but Pride called first, and that's how I had that fight with Vitor. They called on two weeks' notice, and at that time, you know, Pride was the big show in the UFC. You know, everybody wanted to fight in Pride. And so I took that fight in Pride. I think it was in January or February, and I actually was supposed to fight Phil Baroni in the UFC, like, you know, well, I didn't perform well, and I lost, and so I lost my chance at the U 
of my UFC debut, but Dan had already come to some of my shows and I'd met him and we spoke before and, you know, so he knew who I was. Um, so I interviewed well, Dana was there, you know, he came, hey, what's up, Bobby? It was kind of like, we already had a bit of a relate relationship, not like going to his house for Sunday dinner or anything, but just, you know, he knew me professionally. Um, I interviewed well, and then I guess what happened was, and this is in the show, is a lot of guys, they failed the background check. You know, they had some, some type of felony, some type of domestic abuse, something. They failed the drug tests. They failed the steroid test or some combination or all of those three things they failed. And so there were a lot of good fighters that, I mean, when I came out, I mean, there were, I, there were a lot of guys, I can't even tell you the number of guys that I know that, that I knew from the, the industry that names that I recognized that were there. But for some reason, guys got knocked off and it came down to where I became one of the guys selected. And, you know, I was blessed for that. And the rest is kind of history. You know, here it is, what, 16 years, 17 years later, and we're still talking about the show. And the season, season one is still the best season ever. I mean, if you get real tough aficionados, most of them will agree that season one is still the best season. So happy for that. But, you know, unfortunately, I didn't have a great UFC career, but, you know, it wasn't in the cards for me or I, I wasn't good enough, but, you know, everything that Tough did for the sport, I'm a part of that. And I'm happy to even have like a tiny, tiny, however small atomic spec of MMA history under my belt, you know, so. Did the producers like want to put you guys in certain situations? Like they, they say you're going to do this, this and this, or was it more just kind of like putting cameras in a house and being all random? I think that the first season, it really was a lot of random stuff. I think the way the first season played out and what they had to edit with, I think that you can see in subsequent seasons that they were trying to recreate that magic. You know, they were trying to get the Chris Lieb in, they were trying to get the Bobby Southworth, they were trying to get the Josh Koscheck, all of the guys who contributed, contributed not to some of the more memorable, dramatic moments of the show. Um, but on the first season, everybody was learning, man. It was a learning experience. You know, when we got there, they had Hot Pockets and, and Snickers ice cream bars was the food they had for us and then all the alcohol you can drink. So I actually had to go sit down with Dana and tell him and sat down and went, he actually was listening to me. He made a list about the food and that was when you go back and watch the first season, you'll see it. And then you'll see all of a sudden the juicer comes in there's steak, there's chicken, there's fish, there's veggies, there's fruits, and guys are actually arguing, there's food arguments about who gets, right, there's the asparagus argument, there's a famous Diego and Stefan asparagus argument, that was, that was probably the biggest one, and the best one, the most comical, right, I was standing right there for the whole thing, a little bit off camera, it was hilarious, um, but there were a lot of other food arguments, you know, who ate, who eats the steak, who eats the chicken, I mean, but none of that would have been there if we hadn't have if guys hadn't have, you know, stood up and said something. So, and out of the first season, that's where all of the bonuses came. Um, the, the performance bonuses, they used to be called fight of the night bonuses. Now they're called performance bonuses. So that whole speech, and I say this in every interview, the whole, do you want to be a fucking fighter speech? That all started because when we did the show, nobody was supposed to fight. The whole thing was supposed to be challenges and then whoever got through the challenges to the end, those two guys in that weight class were going to fight. But Team Liddell was crutching Team Randy and all of the challenges. And so then they started, they wanted to have us fight early. And I, uh, some of us were not happy about that. It wasn't the fact that we weren't, that we had to fight. It was the fact that we had to fight for free. So I went around and told everybody, okay, this is what we're going to do. Nobody's going to talk. And that's what nobody thought for like 16 hours. And that's what Jen, Dana got pissed off. That's what generated that whole speech of, do you want to be a fighter? And that's where, like when we had the first two fights, okay? I knocked out Loden and Diego beat somebody. I think maybe it was Josh Rafferty. But they saw that and we didn't know that we were getting the $5,000 to finish, right? I think that came in after. But that's what led that whole speech and us doing being us doing the silent or the whiteout and not talking that led to the speech. That's what led to the performance bonuses in the UFC. 
because we had our show. We watched UFC 37 and a half on television and we finished out the show. And then like in UFC 38, either the UFC 39 or UFC 40, that's when the first performance bonuses came in because we had finished out the show and everybody was going for the finish on the show because they wanted to get that five grand. And that segued into the fighters getting first the $25,000 performance bonuses and now the 50. And sometimes when Dan is real generous, I guess in the fights are in Texas, they do 75. So a lot of good things came out of that first season for the fighters. When you talk about all the alcohol you can drink, it feels like they're trying to set you guys up for problems, right? Um, it was intentional. I mean, every reality show that you've seen has alcohol, unless it's Survivor and they're on, you know, unless it's one of those naked and afraid or Survivor and they're somewhere on the beach. But, you know, alcohol is a fuel for drama. And so I think... I don't know what Craig Collegian's background was before that. I don't know what reality shows he, if he did any before that, but from watching the real world, real world and the road rules, um, you, you can see that alcohol played a big part. And at the time, people didn't consider us to be athletes. I mean, there's a whole different view of MMA athletes in general. For one, that we're called athletes, it's not necessarily fighters. At the time, all of the production crew, all of the people involved in the show, they thought that we were just these jerks that if you looked at us wrong on the street, that we would grab you by the neck and try to throttle you. You know what I mean? Or that if somebody bumped into us at a bar, that we would turn around and try to beat in their face. And that wasn't true. I mean, if you go back and look, most of the guys on season one, college graduates, professionals, force was in law enforcement. Um, you know, there were a lot of guys that had career backgrounds already. And so we were just regular people who were somewhat educated and just trying to lead normal lives and we just happened to really like martial arts and competing and I think that the first season opened a lot of people's eyes you know and and it kind of I think it gained a lot more respect for the sport in general I, I remember I mean nobody at that time you know I I I never talked about fighting because and I didn't when I went out, I didn't want my friends to talk about the fact that I was an MMA fighter because most people had a negative view of it. And three things were gonna happen. People were gonna be afraid of you, people were gonna like kiss up to you, suck up to you, or people were gonna want to fight you. And when I went out, I just wanted to go out and have a good time and you know, just be Bobby from around the way, not Bobby from the TV show or Bobby from you know what I mean? And and so I really tried to downplay that. Whereas now, most guys, their whole identity is caught up in, in being an MMA fighter. And it's like before that show came out, I mean, I was high school, all city, all county athlete. I was, you know, a letterman. I was a college athlete. Um, I was a father, you know. And so there were so many more things that were going on in my life to where, and then being, fighting in the UFC, being in the UFC and being an MMA fighter, they didn't define me. And I, that, that was a big difference. You know, I was, after the first round of cuts, I was the oldest guy on the show. I was 35 on the show. And I don't think a lot of people realize that. Um, and most of the guys who were on the season one with me, except for Diego, most of the guys, Forrest, Kenny, um, Nate Corey, Mike Swick, all those guys, they were done fighting by the time they were 35, you know? So... I was lucky. It was kind of like my last dance, my little 15 minutes of fame. And, you know, so. Isn't it interesting how the UC is kind of 180? Because I know those first couple of shows they wanted, you know, he'd say, this is not what martial arts is about. We don't want people fighting in the house, blah, blah, blah. Now it's, that's what the UC is. You know, I, I think it has it has kind of segued into more of the professional wrestling kind of kick where the guys who talk the most and, you know, the guys with the most brag, the guys with the most swag, those are the guys who are getting the big fights and the big purses. But at the same time, you still have to perform, you know? So I think that publicly in the image and some of the things the guys are doing definitely takes away from the martial arts aspect of it. But if you look at what's happened with some of the guys, I mean, Conor McGregor's the biggest, but I think the first, first really 
really good talker. One of the first really good talkers in the fight sellers was Quentin, Quentin Rampage Jackson. You know, he talked a good game. He was a, a bigger than life per personality and he brought a little bit different feel to the MMA game. And he was one of the first guys that, you know, it was Randy and Chuck and then Quentin were the, some of the first guys to, to make real money fighting, you know, and then I think Connor definitely took that to the next level. And I think a lot of the guys are trying to follow Kale, Chael Sonnen as well. And a lot of the other guys are trying to follow in the footsteps and, you know, money does that, you know, and, and, and when money comes in, money comes in, it changes a lot of things and you got to sell the fights. And I think a lot of the fighters are doing a much better job of that. You know, in my era, I never really liked that. I thought it was the producer's job to sell the fights. And I thought I felt, maybe not on camera on the show, but I was kind of more of a quiet guy. Like I said, I didn't, didn't try to put it out there or make MMA like the biggest aspect of my life or my personality, but it's different now. It's big business and a lot bigger than it was before season one and for the first five years after. You gotta do what you gotta do to get paid, I guess. But you did have some memorable moments on the show anyway. Yeah, you know, but those weren't scripted. I mean, some of those came from me being funny. Some of them came from me being an asshole, I guess. Um, but it all made for good television. You know, and a lot of people don't know that Dana, before we came out for the finale, and we all came to the finale, he said they left so much footage on the cutting room floor that, you know, anybody could have been the hero, anybody could have been the villain. I was just, you know, anybody, I was just the one that really came through with playing all of the aspects. You know, I, they played me up to be this great dude in the beginning. And then, you know, more stuff came out with the Chris Lieben incidents and things after that where, you know, it made people think I was a jerk. But I mean, two sides of the same coin, right? I mean, every, anybody who hasn't had their life filmed 24 seven or eight and a half weeks straight and say that they're the nicest person in the world because nobody has seen the other sides of their personality, but there's no one in the world that can say they haven't had a bad day or no one in the world that can say they haven't been a jerk. Um, they're just lucky enough to not have it filmed. So, yeah, was there you know, any time think, when you were in the house and you're like, man, I wish I hadn't come here. This I don't like this being filmed like this. And... Um. It wasn't because of the filming that I wish I hadn't come there, but when you were there and a lot of people think like it's the greatest experience, but you're almost in jail, you know, and you take for granted the fact that when you want to get up and go to the store to get a Coke or to get, or to do something that you want to do and you can do it, you can do that. But on the show, you couldn't being sequestered in we were stuck going from the house to the gym, from the house to the gym for eight and, a, eight and a half, nine weeks. And you couldn't go anywhere else or do anything. And they, we had no television, no books, no newspapers, no magazines. They took Diego brought Diego's kind of a devout Christian. They took his Bible from him because they wanted it to be just us dealing with each other and drinking for the whole time. And, and a lot of people take for granted the freedoms that they have. And it seems like a small thing, but because like Dana said, all you have to do is eat and sleep and train. And you said that this is what you wanted to do. And yes, that's true. But even go back and watch some of the UFC uh, 360s where they follow a Demetrius Johnson or somebody, remember when they used to do those that followed them through their fight camp? Well, when Demetrius Johnson is finished with his two morning sessions and he wants to go wind down, he could go and pull out his little portable, you know, he's, he's a game, kind of a game nerd, right? And he was playing these video games. Well, we couldn't do that. We had to go look at the guy who's on, the, on our team or on the other team. You can't go watch a television program. You can't go put your headphones on and listen to music. And all that has been different. After, all that was different after the first couple of seasons. But the first season was the roughest because that's how they made us live. And yeah, it's great that we got food. It's great that we had a high tech training facility. It's great that we had great coach and great training partners, but there needs to be release, right? And anybody will tell you that any fighter, any trainer, any coach, any um, promoter, you can ask Dana, guys need wind down time or you're going to, you're going to crack. You know what I mean? It's, 
And we didn't have that on season one. And I'm not saying that as an excuse. I mean, I'll openly admit that environment, it broke me, you know, the, it brought out sides of my personality that I didn't know I had. Um, doing that 22 pound weight cut in 20 hours, you know, that definitely broke me. And to this day, I'm grateful to Chuck and Forrest and Josh Koscheck for getting me through that because I, I would have never been able to get through it alone. And I will throw this out there and say, neither would anybody else because there's nobody else who ever had a weight cut on that show that ever made the weight and nobody had to cut 22 pounds. So, you know, and I came, I made that weight cut maybe three weeks into the show and I got on the show with two weeks notice. So within five weeks, I went from 252 pounds down to 227 and then made that cut 22 pounds in 20 hours and got the knockout. So it's, you know, it was, it was different than it is now. You know what I mean? And like, if you watch the shows now, the new ultimate fighters, they're great shows. And I love watching the fights and watching, I don't watch all of the house drama, but it's a lot different. They can have their headphones in, they can watch television, they can do things. It's not just them in the house other guys so you know it is what it is it's still good television i'm still happy to have been a part of it and if i had an offer to go back into the house i'd probably do it again because i had a, it was great the things that dana said that having the, these opportunities and having these things all here for you it was great and at the time you get you lose focus and you don't see it for what it was but i would have i would i would have done it again in a heartbeat Let's talk about the gym that you have now in uh, San Antonio that you've been, you kind of put up on Instagram, you're training. So I, it's, I don't really, I don't really have a gym. So I have some, I have people that I train. So at the beginning I was running the BJJ and MMA program at the UFC gym here in San Antonio. But at the beginning of COVID, those guys sold, <clears throat> they sold the gym. They didn't tell any of the employees. They actually were like telling us the week before, Oh, we're looking to reopen on this date and then the next week it was a text messages we sold the gym bye you know like that was it you know and i worked for them for five years or something five and a half years or something built the program up my brazilian jiu-jitsu program was probably the strongest program that they had going there and you know i just felt that they did me wrong and they sold to a competing gym and so when that gym moved in they took some of my students but i still have about 30 guys that i'm training looking to open a facility but it's been rough with covid you know risky to open a gym some gyms that are that were established and they're already open it's not as risky for them because they're already established but to open a new facility with the, the threat of covid looming over you and the fact that you could just shut down again you know maybe i just didn't have big enough balls to go for it but that definitely is the the, the, the goal it's to open a brick and mortar facility um, AKA American Kickboxing Academy San Antonio, AKA San Antonio and, and B South BJJ. Um, and that's the goal. Um, that's what we're look, I'm looking to do. It's taking some time, but we'll be get, we'll get there eventually. And uh, if people wanted to follow some of what you're doing, where could they look at? Oh yeah. Check me out. Check me if you want to follow what we're doing, some of the jujitsu we're doing. Um, MMA kickboxing, follow me on uh, Facebook slash Bobby Southworth, uh, B South on Facebook as well, B South BJJ, I believe. And then follow me on Instagram, The Real B South. Check us out, see what we're doing. Like, follow, subscribe, or whatever, whatever you always hear. I'm not super tech savvy. All this, this social media stuff is, I want to say it's for the younger generation, but I'm trying to use it and make it work for me. Um, but yeah, check me out at the real B South at IG and at facebook.com slash Bobby South. We hope to see you guys there. Now I did want to close kind of, um, what do you think kind of, uh, the sport as it is right now from coming from the beginning to now, maybe the biggest thing that sticks out to you or just something that you want to bring up perhaps. The biggest, I mean, I'm very pleased with where the sport of MMA is going and, and, and where it's gotten to. Um, the biggest thing I see now is there's so much more parity in the skill level, right? Um, before you had a handful of teams that were perennially at the top, you had 
BTT, you had Militich Fighting Systems, AKA um, Carlson Gracie. I mean, there were, in the beginning, there were a handful of teams, right? And then you, have, you more teams came into the mix. You had MMA Lab, you had Nova Yunyao, you have, I mean, I, like I said, it's been a long time, so recalling all those names on the fly is hard, but there's so much more, there are so many more solid teams out there putting out quality fighters that the parity and the skill level is the talent pool is just so much more deeper and the, and, the, and the level of coaching is so much deeper. That's what I see is that the sport is just going to get better. The fighters are going to get better. Um, and it's going to be harder and harder to make it into the bigger, to the big shows, because you see the UFC can only support so many fighters. And unfortunately, what that's going to do is it's going to make more competition for them because there's going to be a bigger talent pool of fighters and these guys are going to need somewhere to fight, right? And so some of the better fighters are probably going to be moving to organizations and then some of the fighters that get on on skids will probably move to some of the other um, promotions. And that just, I'm not saying that that's better for the UFC as a whole, but for the sport of the MMA and for the athletes as a whole, I think that's much better. Um, and for me, I mean, I'm, I'm, I love the UFC, you know, I'm happy to, like I said, to have been a small part of that, but I'm, I'm all, everybody always asks me, oh, who's going to win this fight? Who do you like? And it's, who do you like in gone versus in gone? It was, I don't like anybody in a fight. I just want to see a good, good performances from both guys and see a quality fight. That's what I look for. And I think that we see more of that. I mean, if you're following the UFC, if you haven't been watching these cards and you're not watching the undercards, you're missing out because some of the best fights of the year of the decade are coming in on these undercards with fighters who aren't main card fighters, who aren't household names. And these people are putting in just amazing performances. And that just, like I said, means the sport is going to another level and the talent pool is getting bigger and the level of the fighters is, is, is closing. There's just going to be more fighters on that high level. Yeah, I think most of us who are, who are around kind of in the early years, we had our favorites, but now we all kind of look at it like you just said. We want to, the the chess match is more interesting than who wins and loses. The chess match definitely, but I I want to see a, a a fight a chess match of fighting, not a chess match of point fighting. You know, I think for a little for your you do have some camps. I think that play a different game. Right. You, you do. And maybe that's just the individual fighters. But in my opinion, there are some camps where you see across the board more that their fighters, they're not they're not fighting. They're trying to win. If that makes sense. Right. They're trying to land just enough strikes and steal a takedown at the end of the round to win the round and win on the judges cards where you have other individual fighters and camps where these guys are coming in to take you out. You know, and those are the fights that I want to see. I want to see fighters, two fighters of high level. Like, what did we just see with with Brad Riddell and Rafael Fazif, right? Two finishers coming in and not point fighting. Two finishers going, standing, toe to toe, landing, damaging punches and coming back. I mean, those are the kind of fights I want to see. And if they're two grapplers, I don't want to see the two grapplers turn it into a shitty striking match. I want to see them shooting for the takedowns and shooting sweep submissions and back takes and scrambles. And you know what I mean? A high level grappling match, like what you would see in a who's number one match, but with striking mixed in, you know, and I think that's what the fans want to see. And I, and like we were talking about with that parity of skill level to be successful in the sport, you are going to have to bring that type of exciting, those type of exciting fights, not just in your set style, but at all the different levels of the game, have solid, exciting fights of striking, of grappling, and, or of takedowns and of ground fighting and submissions. You know, and I think that with parity and skill level across the board, all of the fighters are going to be more able to deliver that on all the different levels and aspects of the fight game. Since you mentioned it before I let you go, you mentioned who's number one. What, why do you think no one's able to beat Gordon Ryan in the no gi element? I mean, I, I've been doing jujitsu for 27 years and that guy does some things that I still, you know, I mean, he's just, it's like sometimes there are always going to be guys who are on another level, right? But even, even now there are guys closing, closing the gap, right? There are 
you have Craig Jones, you have, you know, God, again, when you got, when you get me thinking too fast, all the names I brain fart, but you have a, there are the same thing with grappling where there was one guy dominating and one guy miles ahead of the pack. He's still ahead of the pack, but the gap is starting to close. Right. And we'll never know because he's probably not really going to be competing as much, but in the next generation, because of what he's done and because of people who've trained with him, the next generation, the same with MMA, the next generation of rappers coming up are going to be that much better. So who knows if there'll ever be another Gordon Wright. He may, he may be Frank Shamrock of submission grappling, the guy that got in with the right combination of skill sets at just the right time before the game exploded. There may never be another Gordon Wright. Who knows? But he is just that good. Those are the people that I've asked who are, I have some friends on the East Coast and who know grappling, and that's what they said. It's, you know, there are all the rumors of his, of his lifestyle and his supplement regimen and all that kind of stuff, but that, that has nothing to do with the skill application, you know, and he's definitely been on another level. So we'll see what happens in the future. Does he beat Galval at ADC, ADCC? Um, if Galval asked me that question, if Galval signs, you know what I mean? Are they, is that super? Yeah, it's, signed? yeah it's signed. So assuming it happens, does he I, beat I him? Do you think on, he beats him easily? On, or? on paper, it favors Gordon Ryan, in, in my opinion, in the submission side. Um, but there are the point sides to Abu Dhabi. And I think that Galval has a chance in terms of, of submission escapes and maybe positional advancements and scoring points. I think that game favors Galval, but the submission game definitely favors, especially the lower body submission game favors Gordon Ryan. But Gordon Ryan has a solid upper body submission and positioning game as well. So, you know, it's gonna, and he's the bigger man. So, you know, I mean, size, size does play a factor at that level. Um, but I would say that, that it definitely favors Gordon Ryan. But again, when you're looking at that, it's, I look at it the same as MMA. I want to see a great match and not and not a match where somebody's where they're fighting to not lose, where both guys are going for it and trying to finish. And I think in that and with that kind of a scenario, fans win. And that's really what's important. Well, Bobby, I appreciate you taking the time to do this. You know, I know you're busy, but uh, thanks for having me. No, it's yeah, it's great having you on. I mean, I think you're a great guest. You know, the last yeah. time I was like, I got to get him back on, you know, so I appreciate I you taking to- the time. My pleasure. Thanks for having me, Todd. Yeah, it'll be great. To talk to you again if I get you on sometime. Hit me up anytime. Um, send me, you know, like before, shoot me a link so I can post on all of the, my social media that I'm kind of a white belt social media guy on, but I'll try to get it out there and help you out with that as well. Yeah, I appreciate it. No problem. My pleasure. We'll talk Take again care. soon. Yep.